everyone and welcome to a very spooky edition of the Chilling with the Villain podcast, a Halloween special. Oh, it's getting spooky in here. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. My undertaker. <laughs> of course, I am the villain, Marty Skull. Joining me today, as always, the king of the tables, Samuel Scott. And today, in our Halloween special, we are reviewing the famous WCW pay-per-view, Halloween Havoc 1997. Yes, you all remember that amazing Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero match. But what else happened on this spooky show? Well, we'll answer all those questions today on Chilling with the Villain. Samuel Scott, let me ask you this first. Hello. Trick or treat, Sam? I'm going to go for a treat. Well, that spooky t-shirt that you're wearing, Sam. Yes. Your Halloween edition of Hello Kitty, as you're showing now. Our listeners can't see that. But if you're watching on Patreon, maybe you can. That was actually a gift from me. It was indeed. It says <laughs> wicked cute. And I'm feeling wicked cute today because I dressed up in, I don't know if you can tell. Actually, looking at it now, you probably can't tell. I'm kind of off on this as a certain famous wrestler who was on the card that we're going to review. Are we going to talk about this, Sam? Uh, for, for those that are not watching and that are listening, Sam has turned up on the podcast. Mm. He's wearing sunglasses. Mm-hmm. He's also got a, I don't even know how to you explain it, a goatee. Handlebar moustache. sort A of handlebar moustache. And he's shaven his head and he has the sides of his hair still there, but the top all shaven off. Mm. And I'm going to guess, Sam, that you're dressed as Dr. Phil. I do, don't I? Hang on. <laughs> oh, man. You look like Dr. Phil. I do, don't I? <laughs> okay, that I'm going to admit it didn't come out as well as it did in my head when I had the idea. Yeah, no, I was supposed to be Hollywood Hulk Hogan, but I do look more like <laughs> Dr. Phil, which isn't good. Oh, well, there we go. I, if you were going to say trick, mm. I was going to say that, Sam, I'm going to make you, I'm going to force you to watch a Hogan and Roddy Piper steel cage match from 1997. Which is what we've actually already done. So, <laughs> and we're going to get to it. Also, sort of featured on this pay per view is a gentleman by the name of Sting, the uh, legendary wrestler Sting. And I'm sure everyone knows by now, Sting has just announced his retirement uh, coming up, Revolution 2023. Sting is going to have his last match in wrestling after what? Nearly. 30 years or maybe it's longer than no no, over 30 years yeah probably like 35 36 37 years or something crazy so they haven't announced yet who sting's last opponent is going to be and got me thinking who would you like to see sting's last match against uh sam i know you're not the biggest AEW fan but you watched it a few weeks back so you've got Mm -hmm. sort of an idea who's there who do you think sting's last match should be against an army of fake stings. <laughs> what do you reckon? I don't know about that. I don't know. It's got, it should be quite... I, I think it's going to be a pretty big deal. I've seen a lot of people online saying that they think it should be against Darby Allen. Darby Allen. Yeah, I knew, I, yeah. I understand why people would say that, but and they might do that. But me personally, Sting in his last match, he's going to be a massive baby face. I think putting him against another baby face would be kind of weird. I think he needs to be against a big heel, personally. Um, If I had to pick... I mean, I saw Vince Russo suggesting that it should be Ric Flair, and I was thinking, uh, I'm not sure he already had his last match. (laughs) Yes, but he wants to have another one. A do-over. Don't blame him. I don't think this should be Ric Flair. Um, I think they teased Sting and Chris Jericho, Mm -hmm. and they only ended up working in a tag. I don't know. I feel like Jericho. I think I think he is a baby face again now, but I think a heel Jericho versus Sting would be kind of a good way to go out because it's WCW like WCW throwback. 
Yeah, WCW throwback, and it's still like a first time match, as far as I'm aware. Sting, and yeah, Jericho, and I feel like Jericho can really work around sort of Sting's limitations. If it wasn't that, maybe I mean, personally, I think maybe I assume Sting's probably going to do a tag team match because he hasn't done a singles match since he started in AEW. So I doubt he's going to go out on a singles match. It's probably going to be a tag match team in Derby. I mean, maybe them fighting for the, the AEW tag team titles on the, in his last match against Ricky Starks and um, Big Bill, maybe. I don't know. It's, But it's probably more than likely going to be a tag team match. So maybe Sting and Derby against Edge and Christian. Mm. Do you think these retirement matches, is it ever their retirement match? And also, have they ever been good? Actually, that would be a top five. Maybe we can pass that right now. <laughs> there has been some good retirement. Well, oh, really? I was, well, the Shawn Michaels retirement match was with Taker was really good. But obviously, then he had the match in Saudi Arabia. And the Ric right. Flair retirement match with Shawn Michaels was amazing. But then obviously... Right. He wrestled a bunch of times. So, yeah, good question. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> There's been good retirement matches, yet wrestlers have wrestled after that. They just matches, haven't so. been the retirement match. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> happens that, a lot as well. It, it does. Yeah. Like you never truly you never truly retire from, from wrestling. Another Speaking of that, a man that has retired, and I think he is actually done done, and didn't really get a proper retirement, is Triple H. And we were speaking mm. about Triple H a few weeks ago on the podcast when we had Finders Keepers on the on the show talking about our favorite entrance musics. And there's been a lot of talk this week about my time, the Triple H entrance music. And a lot of people say this is the best Triple H music of all time. But there's a lot of people that say the Motorhead, uh, the game song, Time to Play the Game, is the best entrance music for Triple H. And it got me thinking, I was like, do you know what? Damn, Triple H has probably got the most, like he has the longest list of best entrance music ever in wrestling. Yeah, right? yeah. He had, Especially if you consider DX. Well, that's well. it. So he yeah. had, I mean, he had his early songs, which, you know, for his aristocrat character, which I thought were good and fitting for the gimmick. But he had My Time. He had D-Generation X. He had Motorhead, The Game. He had... Uh, the King of Kings. He had the uh, Evolution song, you know, the oh, um, yeah. the line in the sand, which was awesome as well. So yeah. Triple H has just had like banger after banger after banger entrance music. And so I can't really think of many other wrestlers that have had like such like a, a large amount of iconic entrance songs other than Triple H. I remember you saying on the In Your House game that you used to just play his music and dance around your room to it. <laughs> And that My Time mus uh, entrance theme, actually, I don't know what they say in it. Just like with the RVD theme, I don't mm -hmm. know what anyone's saying in them. But in school, I had the headmaster, the head teacher was called Mr. Bush. And I okay. used to always run up to him at lunchtime and go, keep the record playing, Mr. Bush. And then I used to run away. I don't know if that's actually the lyrics to the song, but they are to me. Just like how you thought it said Martin, Martin. <laughs> Well, that's funny. If you read that, like, if you actually read the lyrics to "My Time," it's kind of the, the lyrics are kind of lame. You know what I mean? It's like, "Oh, your stupid rules." The whole song's like, "I'm a rule breaker." Mur. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not it's not the coolest when you when you look back on it now. But that goes for a lot of things from that era. So there's a trend in this era that I want to talk about. So also. A few weeks ago, we were talking about how I can get with the Undertaker wearing sneakers to the ring. Okay. Mm. And it got me thinking have you noticed how, in this day and age, so many wrestlers wrestle in sneakers? Yeah. So I feel like it started with Shane McMahon, who used to wear the sneakers to wrestle in, and it kind of worked for him because he wasn't technically a wrestler. So that kind of worked. And then John I want to say Cena. John Cena was doing it. It worked for him because of his gimmick. Mm -hmm. And then I feel like the young bucks started doing it. And I thought that was cool. And now you watch a wrestling show and it seems like half the wrestlers are wrestling in sneakers. What is your opinion on that? Or, or the listeners, what do the listeners think? Like, do they like the fact that wrestlers are wrestling in sneakers now? 
or are you more old school and prefer the traditional wrestling boots? I'd be interested to know because like I said, you can't watch a wrestling show from in this day and age from any of the companies without seeing, you know, a pair of Air Jordans or Converse, even mm -hmm. this wrestling sneakers all over the show. What are your thoughts, Sam? I think John Cena gets away with it. Yes. Shane McMahon does. gets away with it. I don't think the Young Bucks get away with it. But, and here's the controversial opinion, I think The Undertaker gets away with it. <laughs> because I really like his over it granddad era. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Okay. It's like when he came to the ring in NXT the other week, it reminded me like he, it, it just looked like he had to get off of it, get off of his favorite seat and right. like get his bike out and drive over there, you know? It, I liked he, it. I actually kind of enjoy his, this whole thing. This I get the impression happened, yeah. that like he took the family to like either Universal or Disney and was like, oh, I've got to just pop over to NXT quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I like that. Yeah. And his t shirt and sneakers. Right. The only yeah. thing that could have made it better if he was like wearing like an NXT t-shirt as well. <laughs> I just doesn't, you know, so removed from the Undertaker gimmick. Well, you know, it's funny because he, I guess, he, what's the story? Undertaker like retired and he sort of finished the Undertaker gimmick. And then he, he came back for a match and was the, the American badass. I think it was the Boneyard match with AJ during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And then I guess a year or two later, I think this was like a year or so ago, they wanted Undertaker to come out on Raw and he was there and they tried to go through rehearsals and they started playing sort of the old school Undertaker music and Taker said, no, cut it. Okay. Like what? Yeah. He's like, I'm not doing the dead man anymore. Like I, I came back as American badass. Like the dead man is done. Like I'm Mark Calloway now. I'm only going to do American badass. So I think we've seen the last of the dead man. Over at granddad era. I like <laughs> Over at Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you this, Sam. Mm. Do you think as The Undertaker has got older that his testosterone has declined? Probably. I mean, that's what happens, right? He's still got a fair bit of it, you can tell. You know, he's one of those guys who's just built different. But probably, right. yeah. But it's going to happen as you get older, right? Of course. Yeah. It, it happens. Right? Well, Sam, that's actually pretty interesting because this actually ties in to our new sponsor, LegacySups.com. Yes, Sam, because you know this, men are in decline. The average strength in men has decreased, okay? Sperm counts are at an all-time low. I don't even need to tell you this. I'm sure you already know this, but depression is at an all-time high. We're all feeling it. We are. We can admit down the show. And we don't talk about this sort of stuff enough until now. It's time to turn things around. The reason? Testosterone levels are under attack from a host of chemicals that we are exposed to every single day. I'm talking about soaps, deodorants, shampoos, shower gels, vaping, seed oils, and so many foods you don't even realize. It's all killing your testosterone. Pesticides and other chemicals. And don't forget our phones that we have with us all the time are disrupting our testosterone production and our sperm count. This is not good. With so many things out there causing testosterone decline, it's more important than ever to be proactive and boosting your own testosterone levels with proven ingredients like the ones found in the Legacy Test Stack. Test X9 is Legacy Sports Nutrition's best-selling product and thousands of customers have already used it and reported phenomenal results in their energy, their strength, their sex drive, and their mood. Sounds pretty good, huh? And you know what? Even better. Compounding it with tea assist adds even more proven test-boosting ingredients, as well as estrogen inhibitors to ensure that your masculinity stays exactly where it needs to be. Every ingredient in Test X9 is clinically proven to stimulate natural testosterone production. For complete transparency, there are links posted on the site to external studies for each ingredient so you can make an informed decision yourself. You want to talk about toxic masculinity? Well, toxins are killing your masculinity. Protect yourself and stay 
healthy. As we get older, Sam, we've got to look after our health. We have to. So stop waiting. Level up now at LegacySups.com. Use the promo code VILLAIN for 10% discount. That's V-I-L-L-A-I-N. And get 10% off now just for being a listener of Chilling with the Villain. And also, you support the show at the same time. So get yourself over now to LegacySupps.com. That's L-E-G-A-C-Y-S-U-P-P-S.com. Level up with Legacy. So that was a read for the boys then. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well we're, we're not getting any younger sam it's becoming more and more important to look after yourself as you get older and like do you think legacy com will have something that will turn me from looking like dr phil to hollywood hulk hogan i like, don't at all i don't I, think i don't think the technology's there yet it's not quite there but it has pretty much everything else other than that so <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that you might have to sort out yourself but yeah <laughs> legacy subs man i'm super excited about our new partnership with mm-hmm. legacy subs i think it's it just goes hand in hand with this podcast i think a lot of the listeners of the show they care about their health they care about fitness they care about looking good and everything else so I'm really, really excited. And I think if any of our listeners, if they use these legacy uh, subs products, then reach out to us and let us know the results because everyone I've heard from that's used these products, including myself, has just seen like amazing gains from this and just had amazing results. So I'm really, really excited about our new partnership with legacy subs. Well, Sam, I think it's clear that it's time for you to use legacy subs, but do you know what? Also, what time it is? Time for me to push my button. Do you know what time it is? It's time. It's time for Marty and Sam's Top 5. How quickly is that going to get old? Oh, it's already past it, isn't it? (laughs) I thought we were just doing a one-time thing, but apparently not. Apparently, you're still doing it. It's already in its sneakers age (laughs) era. So for this week's top five, with today's show being a Halloween special, a spooky episode of Mm. Chilling with the Villain, I thought for today's top five, Sam, we would do top five spookiest wrestlers. (laughs) Throughout wrestling history, there's been a whole host of spooky wrestling characters. There's only so many gimmicks you can have, I guess. And every now and then throughout wrestling history, no matter what company or what country, there always seems to be a spooky wrestling character. So today we count down the top five spookiest wrestlers of all time. Coming in at number five for me, it is the Prince of Darkness, Kevin Sullivan. Now, Kevin Sullivan, many people might know him as the booker of WCW. I don't know if too many people realize that Kevin Sullivan was a huge star back in championship wrestling in Florida, the Florida Territory. And during the 80s, he adopted this persona of like a cult leader, an occultist who would invoke the powers of the dark spirits in both his promos and his matches. Basically, Kevin Sullivan was taking advantage of the satanic panic that was going on at the time. In the 80s, they were scared that all this witchcraft was going on and everything else. And you see Kevin Sullivan in his army of darkness, his faction of borderline Satan worshippers. It's really, really creepy. And I think even in some promos, they're like practicing witchcraft and... (laughs) The whole thing's very spooky. So Kevin Sullivan is my number five on Spookiest Wrestlers. Number four, of course, I can't do this list without mentioning a Brit. So my number four is none other than the man of mystery, Kendo Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. Now, Kendo is one of the most famous British wrestlers of all time from back in the 80s. The man of mystery. 
Kendo Nagasaki was a unique character in the sense that he lived his gimmick, okay? He never took his mask off to the point where he wouldn't take it off backstage. In fact, I heard that he used to put it on maybe five miles out from the venue, would put his Kendo Nagasaki mask on and to make sure no one saw him. And he pretty much kayfabe the boys as well because he wanted to keep that mystique to his gimmick. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it. I don't think I can mention... Kendo Nakasaki and spooky wrestlers without talking about the time that Kendo Nakasaki hypnotized someone in the ring. Did you ever see that? I've heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Kendo Nakasaki, he's in a tag team match and he's wrestling the golden boys, which was Robbie Brookside and Steven Regal. And at one point during the match, Robbie Brookside took off Kendo Nakasaki's mask. Now Nagasaki looks very creepy because he's got the contact lenses in and, the weird ponytail and everything else. Mm -hmm. And yeah, essentially he hypnotizes Robbie Brookside. The match comes to a halt, hypnotizes him. And Robbie Brookside turns on his partner, Stephen Regal and starts beating him up. Now this was in 1988 in, well, in British wrestling where mm -hmm. British wrestling was treated like a shoot. I think for the most part, people still believed in wrestling being real a lot of people point to this as the moment that kind of killed British wrestling on TV. <laughs> I mean, this happened in 1988 and that was the year that British wrestling and world of sport got taken off TV. So yeah, spooky, but maybe not the best for business. <laughs> Coming in at number three, Papa Shango. <laughs> now, <laughs> Papa Shango is actually probably my favorite character of Child's Right. A lot of people were going to point to the Godfather. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that was his favorite gimmick. But dude, seeing Papa Shango as a kid, I was just like, this is cool, man. I mean, he was, I'm pretty sure he was based off that character from the James Bond movie. Live and Let Die, yeah. Live and Let Die, that's Baron it. Sa Baron Samadhi? Yeah, I, I don't remember. I don't briefly remember. Okay. But Papa Shango, I mean, he comes to the ring with the skull that was had smoke coming out of it. I, again, I think one of his one of his most memorable moments, or maybe for all the wrong reasons, but he cursed a spell on the ultimate warrior, which made the ultimate warrior vomit everywhere. And mm -hmm. I don't think you can get much more spooky than that. So my number three is Papa Shango. My number two, this will come as no surprise. Actually, maybe it is a surprise because it's not number one, but we can't talk about spooky wrestlers without mentioning the undertaker pretty much his whole gimmick was based off being the spooky wrestler. And again, you don't get much more spooky than burying people alive, making coffins, <laughs> everything else that the undertaker did. So again, he undertaker probably did the scary wrestler, the spooky wrestler better than anyone else. And yeah. most wrestlers, they weren't believable with the undertaker, even though everything he did was ridiculous for some reason, people still believed in it. <laughs> like I remember watching Undertaker as a kid. And of course his whole gimmick was that he didn't sell. And I, as a kid, I was thinking the Undertaker is the best wrestler because he doesn't feel pain. He just doesn't right. feel pain. It's, it's amazing how the effect that no selling had on me as a youngster. So yeah, you, you can't do this list without mentioning the Undertaker. Now my number one, can you guess who it is? Kane. Ah, uh -uh, it's not Kane. My number one spookiest wrestler of all time. Gangrel. <laughs> <laughs> My number one spookiest wrestler of all time. Evil Doink the Clown. Oh. Of course, I'm talking about the Matt Bourne version. Dude, is there anything more scary than an evil clown? I just, I don't know. And you know how much of a fan I am of Evil Doink the Clown. I think it was just such a revolutionary gimmick the, the evil clown i just think ah oh, it's just so perfect what i loved about doink is that his motto was that he only wanted to make himself laugh okay so mm. if he made a kid cry or if he hurt another wrestler he didn't care what people for as long as he was laughing and i feel like that's just such a perfect ingredient for a heel wrestler and of course there are a lot of people that have fear of clowns so an evil clown it's just like, it, and also unlike the other characters on this list, which are kind of not really believable, 
like clowns are a real thing so it's perfectly believable that there could be an evil clown going around right. doing this kind of stuff you know yeah like, I've listened to Matt Bourne shoot interviews and he said that he based his character off the, um, the Joker from the sixties. So mm. I just think, you know, and everyone loves the Joker, of course, like the Joker's just so infamous. So, and certainly in the last five, 10 years, we've seen so many wrestlers try to replicate the Joker from modern times. Evil Doink did it first. So my number one spookiest wrestler, Evil Doink the Clown, Brackets the Matt Bourne version. He is getting a lot of love in your top fives recently. <laughs> I know. I just he, every week I'm trying to incorporate Doink into my top five. Yeah, I'll see like I, I do with it. IRS, Vince McMahon, <laughs> and Gold Dust. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a good way. answer, though, right? It, that's a good. Well, the thing is, there, there, there's a bunch of honorable mentions. I mean, I think The Fiend, Bray Wyatt, you know, definitely is worth mentioning uh boogeyman is for sure i mean actually i don't want to list these all off because they might be in your list so you go ahead right. sorry okay and I'll so your honorable mentions afterwards i was thinking about boogeyman like he's the one that first came to mind so i felt like he should be in the list but actually like that, i felt like he was only kind of spooky on paper and it was more kind of com not comedic but yeah kind of yeah yeah i so I, I actually he is my honorable mention as well he just wasn't like the, the premise is spooky, right? But the execution was kind of more comical. So I didn't put yeah. him in. My number five is the Wyatt family, right? Because I, for me, so Brea Wyatt had a lot of kind of iterations of the same kind of design. But for me, it was the family. And particularly it was Eric Rowan, right? Has like the lamb mask. Yeah. And just seeing that imagery in their vignettes and stuff, I just thought it was pretty spooky. Now they're number five because obviously I was a lot older then. So it's not like I was spooked. But right. I can see if you were like a kid during that era, that would spook you out for sure. I, I no think, question. yeah, I think the Wyatt family was way more spookier than the Fiend. I think. Yeah, the Fiend kind of entered cut. I mean, I like the Fiend. Yeah, uh, but the whole what was it? Fire. Oh God. Firefly, Firefly Funhouse. Fun House. Yeah. yeah. Slash the Fiend, like Alter Ego thing, was like lean towards too kind of um cartoony for me right. it comes down to believability again and the white yes. family like there are kind of families like that in the world you in know america I mean? yeah yeah america, so yeah. i yeah so that no precisely that's exactly my line of thinking as well i also liked um alexa bliss during the during the after the white family time so it's pretty good but for me just like you said the believability aspect is key so that's why the white family go in good as show. opposed to any other bray Wyatt iterations yeah for sure number four kane Kane, Kane, Kane. Now it's got to be the the first version of Kane, right? Um, yeah, of course, <laughs> because he's. Or, well, I guess you could say it's spooky when he was unmasked, <laughs> yeah. and he had, and he basically had a haircut like mine, but blonde. <laughs> <laughs> the first iteration of Kane, where he just like everything about him, his size, like the fact that he's invincible, that he's. Don't want to ruin my list too far, but he was a foil to The Undertaker of all people. You know, he's like, mm -hmm. oh, The Undertaker's finally met his match. It's finally happened. It all adds to this. And he just looks awesome. Towering, the mask, what's behind the mask. You have a, you hear a story about what's behind the mask, but they never show it until they do it. Yeah, the first situation of Kane definitely makes the list. I think as well, just what really put it over the edge, the fact that Undertaker had never really sold for anyone before. And That's, then he yes. finally sold for someone in Kane. That just put Kane just, he came in as that character, like instant main eventer, instant credibility. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, the Undertaker's finally met his match. It's like, if, and if the Undertaker finally meets his match, the person who, you know, his adversary has to be a force to be reckoned with. So Kane, for sure. Kane's only high, like not higher up because he's also just like super cool. <laughs> so kind of like, you know what I mean? Like he's yeah. kind of awesome as well. And to me, that kind of like bring like kind of takes away a little bit. But I mean, hey, spooky and awesome can't go wrong. Number three, Gangrel. Okay, your boy. Don't, again, don't tell me that he. Don't tell me. In my <laughs> mind, he always keeps those in, and he filed down his teeth or whatever he did, got extensions on his teeth or whatever. To me, he's like a real vampire in my head <laughs> canon. He has the goblet with the blood in. You know, drinking from it. Yeah. and everything so it's like and oh, actually can i kind of change my answer and just kind of broadly say the brood yeah of course i think that's yeah. fine i think that's mm. acceptable yeah then i'm gonna do that because his stooges 
yeah, I think the whole thing, the whole blood gimmick, as in the real stuff, and it's not just someone during a match is getting cut open. I mean, he's using it as like a prop, like human blood as a prop, and his mm-hmm. outfits, his flowing, frilly outfits. He looked like he was not just from like another dimension, but from another time. It was just, yeah, very good stuff. Very dark, very good stuff. Number two, Papa Shango, for the, basically the exact same reasons as you. But remember, I used to get into the wrestling games when I was younger, before I watched the show itself. Yeah. So I think it was just called WrestleMania, but maybe I'm wrong on that. It was on the Mega Drive or Genesis. And I just thought, like, how could you not pick him? Right. Like, that was my thought. Yeah. I was like, this guy, just by looking at him, he's going to have powers that will help me just <laughs> destroy the, the opponents. Because he has you know, witchcraft powers, voodoo powers or whatever, <laughs> on top of just his strength. And just, yeah, the, the look of him was super good, super spooky. And like you said, all the hijinks in the ring. I think he's the first person that I've seen who has like the ability to kind of manipulate the lights of the like the arena itself. Uh, other people have done it after this. Maybe The Undertaker did first, I can't. But like, to me, it was Papa Shango. But maybe I'm wrong on that. Mm. Yeah, he might. I can't, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Number one, have I have I stumped you on that? I I don't know. Maybe I'm. I I kind of feel like I'm right, but I guess the comments will let us know. Number one, we get two for the price of one. It's he can't not be number one. It's the Undertaker with Paul Bearer because, like you said, the burying people alive, building coffins. Paul Bearer just day to day walking around like a, dressed as a mortician with his <laughs> um earn it's like that their entire list of day-to-day activities consisted of nothing but spooky goings on <laughs> right. like, how can they not be like, that's just how they filled out their day back then <laughs> well you, so it's funny because i think the spookiest version of undertaker is that original version but do you remember in sort of 90 later 98 and 99 or early 99 he did the whole ministry of darkness undertaker yes. and he kind of try to take it down that kind of like satanic, satanic that satanic yeah. route the ministry and yeah I, yeah the ministry and i spoke earlier about kendo nagasaki hypnotizing someone do you remember in royal rumble 1999 the undertaker came out and hypnotized mabel <laughs> you no. don't remember that and i no, remember I even as a youngster i thought most of wrestling was real and i saw that and i thought Oh, that's the fake part. That's the fake part of wrestling that people talk mm-hmm. about. Like, has hip, hypnosis ever worked in wrestling? Like, has it ever been done well? I don't think so. I, don't, I feel like hypnosis, like, it should be left outside of wrestling. Jinder Mahal, charming Cobra. <laughs> it's the only time it's been done well. So... I feel like, you know, like the Ministry Undertaker, that thing. Like I just feel like we already had the brood for that. And that was like, better, that was a better version for me. What do you mm-hmm. think? Well, yeah, I saw an interview the other day when they asked Gangrel, like, oh, were you happy when you joined the Ministry of Darkness? He was like, no. It's like, I knew that was going to be the end of the brood. Because yeah. they'd go into that group and then they're kind of the same as everyone else. And after that, they're just going to get kicked out and broken up and everything else. So, yeah, I think... I was, I don't know, the ministry I was, was already kind of, happy with the brood. I like the brood, yeah. And then they, they joined the ministry with the corporations. So it just didn't really make sense at all, no. you know? Like the corporate ministry, just, I don't know, it didn't really work for me. Like, why would these guys hang out with these guys? Didn't really make sense. Right. We had a comment from ages ago now on the Paul Bearer reel, which didn't do as well as I personally feel like it should have done. I'm sorry. But who said, oh, it's okay. It's like maybe gifts will start making you feel a little <laughs> bit better about it. <laughs> if we ever get one. But, uh, somebody said, hey, for you, like the the pool bearer without the makeup, like the redhead pool bearer mm. or the makeup pool bearer, which one do you prefer? For me, the makeup one all the way. Oh, yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Of course. That's pool bearer. The other one to me right. is Percy Bringle, you know? Like, yes. Yeah. I think yeah. the same thing as you. All right. Well, Sam, that was Marty and Sam's Top five. I'm not doing the jingle. You don't need to. No, I don't need to do the jingle. I guess we best get into our review today. The moment that you've all been waiting for. Halloween Havoc 1997. The company World Championship Wrestling. The date, October 26th, 1997. Las Vegas, Nevada at the MGM Grand Garden Arena. The attendance for the night, 
12,457 people packed into the MGM to watch this historic WCW pay-per-view. The buy rate, Sam, you want to give it a guess? Oh, okay. So 1997, good year, right? Good year for WCW, yes. Yeah, for WCW. Holiday spirits and all of that just will tie in. So I reckon... Now, actually, I've never really thought of a oh, WCW one before to base this on. I'm going to say 400, or is that too much? It's pretty much spot on. 405,000. Oh, can I have, please, may I have a, my <laughs> treat, on. a margin of 5,000, by the way? <laughs> I think that's pretty good. You did a great job. You know what? I'm pretty sure. Let me double check that. Like, I feel like that's more than WrestleMania that year. Yeah, WrestleMania in 1997 that would have been what wrestlemania 13 yeah it's a lot more than wrestlemania 13 wow. wrestlemania 13 did 237,000, which i think is the Damn. lowest uh, super low the lowest ever i think so oh geez that's bad wcw was hot there in 1997 go. yeah um, <laughs> so first thing i'm gonna say i love the idea of a halloween themed pay-per-view like i think that's so cool and America has always had this kind of obsession with Halloween. I'd say a lot more so than other countries. So yeah. I think it's really, really cool that, you know, they do this Halloween, Halloween Havoc, just the name is cool. And of course that brings the set for this show, which mm. like, I, I miss that as well. Just set themes for pay-per-views. Now it's just like, seems like it's always just a big screen, but actually having physical sets, I think is really, really cool. I will say this though, my favorite set of all time is from Halloween Havoc 1998. The massive pumpkin that they had, I just thought was so freaking cool. And now WWE, or should I say NXT, they do a pay-per-view now or a special or PLE, whatever it's called, of Halloween Havoc. Mm. And I'm just praying one day that they bring back this iconic pumpkin entrance set it's just so freaking cool <laughs> I've, never, I've never seen it oh you have so to maybe check. we'll cover it one year yeah it's really really cool i just wanted to get that out there because that's what i think of when i think of halloween havoc is that massive pumpkin setup so love this the idea setup, though, yeah this setup is pretty awesome as well huh i really really enjoyed it i like the it reminds me of in your house a little bit with the lawn yeah yeah kind of yeah and yeah. but yeah and then there's the um just all the gravestones. It was super good, like really fun. They had to come out from behind a skull. By the way, the design of the skull is really pretty cool. Yeah, was it a skull? I thought it was more like a, well, it's kind of like a vampire type skull, right? Or it has like fangs, is that right? It's no, it's got, I feel like it's got like a smirk. Okay. <laughs> uh, whatever it is, skull, whatever you want to call it. I just think the entire thing is very, like the whole set was very cartoony and, yeah. you know, it, it wasn't morbid. No, no, you know, it's very so. kind of light and child friendly and just a lot of fun, just very spooky fun. Yeah, I think WCW considered Halloween Havoc as one of their biggest pay per views, if not the biggest. I mean, obviously, Starcade was supposed to be the biggest one, but I feel like Halloween Havoc, that brand, might be the most iconic almost. Like, it's just so easily memorable just because of the set and just everyone loves Halloween, you know? Yeah, Bash at the Beach is kind of memorable for me for just like the name. Yeah. But yeah. but the, the kind of like design for me is more memorable for Halloween Havoc. Absolutely. Well, this Halloween Havoc, we kick it off hot as we start with New Japan's Yuji Nagata defeating Ultimo Dragon in nine minutes and 42 seconds. This is 1997 and I believe... WCW still had a strong relationship with New Japan. So from time to time, you'd see different New Japan guys on the show. It's actually kind of funny. So Ultimate Dragon, he, I want to say he tried out for the New Japan Dojo and maybe did some training there, but they wouldn't accept him because they thought he was too small. And I'm guessing this was in the late 80s, early 90s, I, I want to say. Um, you know, obviously when wrestlers were a lot bigger. So they, they wouldn't take him. So he flew himself to Mexico to go learn how to wrestle in Mexico. And, you know, ultimately, no pun intended, ended up becoming a, a really big star and later on worked for New Japan and won the uh, 
junior heavyweight title, which I've also won, by the way, and everything else. And I just think that's such a cool story. Like most people would have just given up there and then, but right. just, just fly yourself to Mexico and everything else. Yuji Nagata is actually one of my favorite wrestlers to watch. I actually feel like in later years, he was a lot better than he was here. I always wanted to wrestle Yuji Nagata. And there was one year at the Tokyo Dome where leading up to it for Wrestle Kingdom, this is when I was there with the Elite and Bullet Club. And myself and Hangman Page hadn't been told what match we were in. And we were like, what's going on? Like, we're going to have a match at the Tokyo Dome, right? And we're like, we we need to ask the booker, who's funny enough is in the next match. And we're like, let's go ask him. So we asked him, like, what, what match should we, you know, have for the pay-per-view? And he said, oh, you're in the pre-show tag team gauntlet. And I was just so bummed out and annoyed. And I felt like I was kind of getting punished because they all thought we were leaving. When in actual fact, I had no real intention of leaving, but the rest of the elite did. And I was like, I feel like we're being punished for this. And honestly, it got to the point where I was like, I might tell him I can't do it. Because I was just so like, I don't think New Japan realized sort of how much business that we were creating for mm. them in America. I was thinking, I've got the number one selling New Japan t shirt with Villain Club. At numerous points, it was selling more than Bullet Club, I guess, because everyone already had the Bullet Club t shirt. Mm. And I was just, I don't know, I was just really annoyed about it. But I, I remember also speaking to Jericho about it and just said, like, what should I do? Do you think I should do it? And he was the one that kind of encouraged me to, to do it so no you make that pre-show you make that your wrestlemania you make it the you know the biggest thing ever and everything else and he was right like looking back kind of seems silly to be like oh i'm not gonna work the tokyo dome show but you know when you're annoyed and you're emotional you yeah you think differently um but the only saving grace was is that in the tag team gauntlet it was myself hangman page and i think yujio and i can't even remember the other team but i just know yuji nagata was in it and i was like okay i'm doing my stuff with yuji nagata so I got to wrestle Yuji Nagata at the Tokyo Dome, which was just like so cool for me. And then later, one of the first things I did as Ring of Honor Booker is I brought back the Ring of Honor Pure Wrestling title and booked a Pure Wrestling tournament. And I booked myself in the first round against Yuji Nagata. And unfortunately, it never happened because the pandemic came and ruined mm-hmm. everything. So it never happened. I never got that one on one match with. Yuji Nagata, which really actually breaks my heart. So I'm still hopeful that one day I'll get the chance to wrestle him. So New Japan, give me a call. That would be nice, please. Um, unfortunately for Yuji Nagata, I feel I feel like you'll find this kind of interesting. But Yuji Nagata was a victim of Inokiism. Now you've heard of Antonio Inoki, right? Yes. Yeah. So during the early 2000s. MMA basically exploded in Japan and it became yeah. far more popular than wrestling. So Anoki at the time, the president of new Japan thought that for wrestling to compete with MMA, it needed to be more like MMA. So he brought some MMA fighters into new Japan, but at the same time he wanted his, his wrestlers and his talent to mm. fight in MMA. So Poor Nagata, who was Jeez. one of the biggest stars of New Japan at the time, who I don't believe has any MMA background or didn't have any MMA background, maybe some amateur wrestling. They put him in an a MMA fight against Crow Cop in 2001. <laughs> and then later on, Fedor in 2003, right? Both matches ended in under a minute. I think the... <laughs> I think the Crow Cop one lasted like 20 seconds. So yeah, it just, um, not good. And it just kind of killed Nagata's momentum because he's like the top star of pro wrestling and then just got completely destroyed in MMA, but he should have never been put into that situation. And just, you know, knowing pro wrestling doesn't mean you're going to master MMA. It's a whole different kettle of fish. So yeah, that kind of, you know, that hurt New Japan's business as well, because then they're like, oh, the wrestlers aren't tough guys, you know? So yeah, that was Enochism. It's a whole thing. Maybe one day we'll do a whole episode on it on the podcast. But here we are, Yuji Nagata against Ultimo Dragon, two of the greatest Japanese wrestlers of all time. This was a really 
fun, good match opener for WCW. The audience had no idea who Yuji Nagata was, I don't think. And Ultimate Dragon gets a pretty good reaction just because he looks so cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I thought this was a pretty fun way to open the show. Totally agree. Lovely, punchy opener. Very good. Oh, before, we should probably mention the commentary team is top tier for this event. We got Dusty Rhodes, who's just frigging hilarious. <laughs> Tony, you don't think so? I think he is. He's hilarious. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Bobby Heenan. Just yeah. so you got two, jo- and you've got Tony Schiavone in the middle, but then, you know, he's just bookended by these two just hilarious guys, old Absolutely. school guys. It was just perfect. But yeah, neg- uh, yeah, lovely, punchy little opener. We like, you know, I like a good, my, the, the opening match is more important for me almost than the, than the main event in a pay-per-view. So this set the tone nicely. Nagata's manager, Sonny Ono, right? Yes. Comes, you know what I'm going to say probably, maybe, maybe not. As they're making their entrance, the fireworks go off behind them and he pops out his camera and him and Nagata do a selfie, right? Which I believe you said was like his thing. Yeah, it's kind of his gimmick, I think, yeah. First selfie in TV history? I don't know about that. When have you seen a selfie on TV prior to 1997 did kevin in home alone not take a selfie with his polaroid camera did that happen or did i imagine that Uh, i don't know i mean well that's a movie but okay but fair enough but i actually don't i don't know the comments are gonna have to figure this out i'm pretty (laughs) sure i'm gonna go ahead and say that was the first selfie on tv history sunny ono with the first ever selfie Selfie. yep (laughs) chris jericho defeats ghetto in seven minutes and 18 seconds ghetto gado i might be saying it right i know i, sh- I was gonna I ask should, you well i should know because i worked for him for years and years <laughs> oh my Wrestled god him. Like- i'm terrible um again so this was before gado was so now ghetto is the booker of new japan he has been for years back here i want to say he was wrestling for was it war or fmw maybe and i believe he was on a tour of the States. I think he was just working like independent dates and somehow managed to get booked on one of WCW's biggest pay-per-views of the year. <laughs> and they put him here against Chris Jericho. Um, there's a lot of international flavor to WCW during these years. And one of the things people always say about WCW, and it's kind of true here is the undercard was always really good and exciting and a lot of great workers and wrestlers, but then it was always it was always ended with a main event, which was always a massive letdown. <laughs> but this match, seven minutes long, it was decent. It was a fun, decent match. Uh, the one point in the match, Gato and Jericho climbed to the top rope and Jericho I tries it. super Frankensteiner from mm-hmm. the top rope. And I guess just like the timing was off. Or whatever happened, Jericho just completely spikes himself on his head, like neck first into the mat from the top rope. The most hilarious thing was, is that the commentator said that Jericho calls this move, the Jericho spike. And I was thinking (laughs) he just got not on him. Yeah. Yeah, He he just spiked himself. Like literally is the Jericho spike. So that was really tough to watch. Right. Yeah. And I think, yeah, the commentary also said something like, maybe I'm wrong, but like Jericho didn't get all of it or like (laughs) like, managed to block it or something. I'm like, are you kidding me? (laughs) Right. right, Two things make this, it was bad. Uh, Not the match that, that Frankenstein, super Mm -hmm. bad. Now two things made it even worse than it already was. The first one was we saw a lovely top rope Frankensteiner or like second rope Frankensteiner in the match before. Very Mm -hmm. good one. And the second thing is they, God, they showed it in excruciating slow motion in the post-match highlight replay. Yes. I would, not, I'd be like, I would never show that again. That and they're so like, weird. let's see that again. It was, I think it was from a different angle as well. I'm like, yeah. no, stop drawing attention to it. <laughs> it. So the Jericho spike, he obviously didn't keep, but it did get me thinking about how Chris Jericho has had a whole host of finishing moves over the years, right? Yeah, Jericho had... The Wolves of Jericho slash Lion Tamer. He has the Judas effect. He has the Lion Salt. Mm-hmm. He had the Breakdown. I don't know if you remember that, which the Miz now uses like the full Nelson face slam. And of oh. course, he has the Code Breaker. And it's like, 
wow, Jericho's had a whole bunch of like good over finishing maneuvers. So he might be, you know, in the run for the wrestler with the most over finishing maneuvers. <laughs> I was just thinking about that during during this match. Which is your favorite Jericho finisher? It's not I, I you're gonna you're just gonna get annoyed when I say this, but I always like his double power bomb. I know it's not a finisher, but he pulls <laughs> that out. No, he pulls that out a lot. And it, I don't know why, but like it always surprised me, even though I know even though I expect it. I, I feel like the lion soul has the most spectacle. But on the other hand, you can't not think of the Wolves of Jericho. I feel like he's done a really good job in getting that Judas effect over because the first time I saw that, I was like, huh, like a finish. Hmm. And like, of course, the first few times you do it, it's not going to get a response because people don't right. know it. And, but as soon as he starts beating people with it and people have seen it a few times, they, they start to get it. They're like, oh, it's his finish. And so I think he's so clever. Like he can st still do the line salt now, but he doesn't have to rely on it. You know what I mean? It's like, but the Judas effect he can do forever you know what i mean yeah. so like even the lion team is probably like a hard not a hard move to do but when you're standing there and you're squatting it can take a lot out of you but the judas effect mm -hmm. just so simple and quick and he can heal it on anyone it can be reversed he can hit out of nowhere so it's kind of like the perfect finishing maneuver um yeah. and yeah this was in 1997 and chris jericho is still going strong today and so is ghetto as well at, at new japan so yeah, when you worked for Ghetto at New Japan, mm -hmm. was was he also dressed like Ronald McDonald, or did he only do that for <laughs> no. this match? Just like Ghetto, he, he like he, how do I say this correctly? So he lost a lot of weight since here in '97. Like he looks better now than he did back then. <laughs> oh, was was he? What well, do you reckon he was covering for his weight with that baggy? Maybe, yeah, he looked kind of indie esque, but like no, Ghetto. Um, ghetto yeah he's like in good shape and stuff and he's you know he must be you know getting on a little bit now but he, like i said he probably looks way better here than he does there but ghetto always just really loved me and i think they actually talk about it on the commentary during this they say oh like ghetto was a massive fan of sort of 70s memphis brawling and everything southern, else, style, southern style wrestling and i think because i was such a flamboyant character and just my wrestling style is so unique and different. Like Ghetto was always just, he loved all my stuff. And anytime he wrestled, he'd want me to break his fingers. And yeah, I I have a lot of respect for Ghetto. And just, um, you know, every time I'd come back from a match from uh, in New Japan, I would just go straight up to Ghetto. Like, how was it, boss? And he'd either say, thank you, good job, which kind of meant like, oh, I wasn't that amazing. He'd either say, good fucking, great job, great fucking match or whatever. Or which meant like, okay, that was good. Or it'd be like standing ovation, like clapping. And when you get the claps, like that was legit the best feeling in the world. <laughs> like, I don't care what people say about it on the internet or anything else. If I come back and ghetto standing there clapping, that is like the most rewarding thing ever. And I was just always wrestling for that approval, approval from ghetto. So that's my memories of ghetto. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Speaking of memories, this is undoubtedly what this show is best known for as Rey Mysterio defeats Eddie Guerrero to win the WCW Cruiserweight Championship where his mask was on the line. Mm. Now, I don't really know what we can say about this match that hasn't been seen before. Of course, it's two of the greatest wrestlers of all time. Legit, these are two of my two of my Mount Rushmore, you know, <laughs> like are in this match. So of course I love it. I'm all over it. What I will say is there's been so many great Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero matches. And I think, I guess this one just sticks out because I don't know why. Maybe it's just because they seem just to like nail everything in this match. And it's pretty just completely flawless. I mean, it also 13 minutes and 51 seconds, nearly 14 minutes. And these guys just, do not stop. Like they're just no. going and dude, this is in 1997. The main event is Hogan versus Roddy Piper in a cage, but they had this on the undercard. It's such a contrast between <laughs> this and the main event. I did think it's cool. Like everyone always remembers Rey Mysterio's really cool purple bodysuit. And I, I love the fact that 
the mask was all in one piece to yes. the suit, to yeah. the bodysuit. And they said it was because previously Eddie Guerrero had like taken Rey Mysterio's mask off. So he's like, okay, now I'm going to wear this bodysuit. So I thought that was a really nice touch. I'm going to say this. This is kind of a bold statement, but maybe it's not. Is there anyone ever better in the ring than Eddie Guerrero? Like the way he moves, the way he sells, just how he flies around the ring, just his technique, his aggression, his intensity. I just don't think his abilities in the ring can be matched by anyone. And now I know there's other, you know, people argue Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart and Bret Hart, yeah. loads of other wrestlers. But for me, Eddie Guerrero in the ring, bell to bell, greatest of all time. He's got to be like, I'd, yeah. If I could wrestle like any, if I could have the wrestling abilities of any wrestler, it would be Eddie Guerrero. Yeah. He's just absolutely fantastic, isn't he? He is. He's, he just, yeah. And he looks good. Like WCW Eddie Guerrero is like kind of like my favorite look. Oh really? And yeah, I think it looks really cool. Yeah, I love the mullet. I love the mullet. The mullet, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, it, mate, this match was so good. You remember when PJ mentioned doing the four fifty off of the ladder, and, but there was like so little room. It was like doing it in a phone box. Yes. When Rey Mysterio jumps over and he looks like a flying squirrel, he jumps off the top ropes, like over the post, over the stairs, but like before the crowd barrier you know like yes. that was such a but like they both just nailed it perfectly it was so good it was yeah oh it's amazing i wonder what dave Meltzer gave this out of five probably i don't know if he Wait, didn't give it oh, five stars then he's lost the plot but um... well i mean <laughs> okay so he gave it four and three quarters oh, out come of five on. it lost a quarter of a star because it didn't have kenny or the bucks in but actually, no, I think I think that I think four and three quarter stars is fair because I would dock this Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio match a quarter star for not being over the custody of Dominic. <laughs> but like, apart from that, it was perfect. Dude, I've had a five star match. I don't think I've had a match as good as this. <laughs> Dude, it was so good, wasn't so it? The, some the, the, stuff what... happened. Sorry, I'd say some stuff like they did. I like I don't think I've still like ever seen since. Like it's it was just like a very mind blowing match for me. By the way, I've never seen this pay per view before we reviewed it. Right. It blew my mind. So the one spot from this match that everyone remembers is the um moon salt DDT, DDT from yeah. Ray to Eddie. And I want to say this no one, including Ray himself, actually, no one has been able to replicate that move since. Like I've seen, I want to say I saw Ray try to do it with Ricochet and they pretty much nailed it, but just not as smooth and as clean as they do here. And obviously, you know, this was years later when Ray was older. I just, I just think it just speaks to the abilities of both Ray and Eddie at the time. And these, right. this day and age, we see so much crazy stuff and we see people do insane maneuvers and high spots i've never seen anyone replicate this moonsault ddt like perfect. <laughs> unbelievable the only like it's funny when they hit it it wasn't like a false finish or anything i think they hit it and they went into maybe a dive on the floor or something but i'm not going to critique it obviously because this was you know crazy what's really funny i'm not sure if it was bobby heenan that said this or if it was i might have been dusty but the commentators say this will go down as one of the greatest title matches in pay-per-view history. And they were right there, huh? Like they, people are still talking about this all these years later. I thought they said in the history of like the pay-per-view is in Halloween Havoc. And I'm like, hey guys, dream bigger. Like this is going <laughs> to oh, go down in like friggin' pay-per-view history full stop. Oh, maybe they did say that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think they did. I'm like, really guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, this, <laughs> this is the, like, it's like I said, it's weird though how, Ray and Eddie had so many great matches. This just seems to be the one that always gets all the love and all the talk. And I think a big part of that is that Halloween Havoc theme. It's just so memorable, you know? So, and Ray's costume and like Ray's just costume. all of it just tied together, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, Eddie Guerrero is someone that I took so much inspiration from. And, you know, Re Eddie wasn't really a high flyer, even though he could do some pretty athletic things like the frog splash and the... The roll over the ropes and stuff but he was more of a base for the flyers and that's kind of yep. how i see myself in wrestling i 
a base for guys like Osprey or Ricochet or Young Bucks, whoever it might be. Um, so I always saw myself kind of in that Eddie Guerrero role, you know, and it's like, okay, he's not going to be a high flyer, but he's going to make up for it in his technical ability, his aggression, and ultimately his character. So I just, man, like, I just wish that I would have had a chance to have met Eddie. Of course, I would have loved to have had the opportunity to wrestle him. And unfortunately, you know, that didn't work out time-wise. Um, but even the chances to meet him or to have dinner with him. I mean, I have met and spent some time with Vicky Guerrero, which was mm -hmm. cool. Um, I'm pretty good friends with Chavo Guerrero. And, you know, we got on like a house on fire. And anytime we, I, I see him, inevitably we end up talking about Eddie and I just, he probably gets annoyed at me because I'm just like, I just want to, I mean, I ask. How Chavo, could you and, not though? I, right. I just, I'm like, I, you're the closest thing I'm ever going to get to meeting Eddie Guerrero. So mm -hmm. can I pick your brain and ask you these <laughs> questions about Eddie, you know? And actually one of my biggest compliments, I think ever in my whole entire life, I spent the evening with Chavo once. I want to say we're in San Francisco and we were there. I want to say for an autograph signing but we were having drinks and just hanging out and having a good time. I think there were other people there as well. And he said to me, he's like, yeah, man, like you're old school. Like Eddie would have really liked you. And I was like, oh man, like you just, I bet that was good to hear. Yeah. That was just Dude. like so cool. So yeah. Thank you, Chavo. That was awesome. <laughs> sure. Speaking to Eddie's just like you said, like bell to bell technical abilities in the ring. Whenever somebody comes off the top rope to do a move and somebody moves out of the way, they always just like eat shit. Like they just like eat it, right? Mm -hmm. But Eddie, he does he does this thing where like I think I guess it was a frog splash or something, but he goes, Ray moves out of the way, and Eddie like cancels his plans, like mid yeah. and like pivots and like just does ends up like just doing forward roll and carry a roll on. through, and just, yeah. And it just makes him look so polished i i was thinking about that i was like i really don't think i could do that i don't know how he does that without killing himself like that's crazy a very underrated really because the people don't you know normally goes into something else really quickly so people don't really give it the appreciation or the pot that it deserves but that's I a felt, really hard yeah, thing I, to, <laughs> to I, know, so, I felt like it needed to be brought up it needed the appreciation so there was no chance in following this match, obviously. <laughs> no chance. And especially probably not with the next <laughs> next match. So after like one of the greatest matches of all time, they give us Alex Wright uh, defeating Steve <laughs> Mongo McMichael in six minutes and 31 <laughs> seconds. Um, I'm actually kind of a fan of both Mongo and Alex Wright. Mongo, of course, not necessarily for his wrestling abilities, but I did think he was a good character. And like, he was a real man, you know, he was a former yeah. football player and right. you could believe him, you know, like I thought he was a, a good character, a good talker. Alex Wright, Alex Wright's from Germany. Um, he's mm. the son of Steve Wright, who was a famous wrestler in Europe. When people talk about European wrestlers in the States from, you know, the 70s, 80s, 90s, Alex Wright's name never really gets mentioned. And he had this run in WCW. And then when WCW died, he just, kind of career came to a halt or at very least he went back to Germany. Um, he actually tried to book me for some shows at some point, but um, yeah, people don't really mention Alex Wright's name. It's kind of a shame he never got a run in the WWE, um, but this match, yeah, it's pretty much what you'd expect. Um, the only really interesting thing is, is Goldberg comes out and yep. spears them both and Jack Hammers them both. And it leads to um, Alex Wright getting the win. But yeah, this match, I, I don't even have any uh, any notes down for this one. <laughs> no, me neither, really. I don't think feel like Alex Wright really had like a standout look. Maybe that's part of it. So like, he's quite good in, like he's good in the ring, but I just like, just doesn't like pop. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I mean, his gimmick as well was just like he danced and that was kind right. of it, right? Yeah. Right. I don't know. Yeah. I, yeah. Shame. Yeah. This match was, oh, geez, at least... <laughs> I don't know. It had Deborah in doing hijinks. Um, yes. They tried to set it up beforehand with the backstage part where Mondo's trying to like get all what he spent on Deborah back from her, like in the locker room. Because they're getting a divorce, right? Because the they're getting line? a divorce. Yeah. Right. But like they're handling it in the locker room. And even um, Mean Jean's like, guys, 
this these type of things are usually done in a court of law <laughs> in a WCW <laughs> locker room during a pay per view. So like that part was good, but then like it was followed up with the match itself that it was just a complete like but honestly it's a bit of a dud. No match could have followed no, the Ray and Eddie no. match, so but, you know. But still, like it wasn't great. Like well, anyway, but of its own merit. Right. So how do they follow that up? They got to do something different, and what they do is something different. We have a man versus woman match. That's how it's mm-hmm. billed. As Jacqueline defeats Disco Inferno in nine minutes and 39 seconds. Man. Now, God. Right. Okay. Uh, first of all, like Jacqueline looks great, doesn't she? Yes. But this match kind of like really annoyed me because he, Disco Inferno, like obviously like doesn't want to fight. He doesn't want to participate. So he's trying to like stall and get away with from her at all costs, which is like, makes sense for his character, right? But like, who thought that would also make good viewing? Like you said, not how how long was this? I can't believe that this was nearly 10 minutes long of like a guy trying to avoid a woman. <clears throat> that I will agree with. What I will say is this. When I was researching this show and I saw sort of the journalist of the time reviewing this show, they all said that this was a flop or a dud or a waste of time. I actually thought this was pretty entertaining, right? Disco Inferno gets a lot of hate, but when you watch back WCW and WCW Nitros, every time he comes out, the crowd reacts. You see the crowd doing the dance. Like he's, he's over. They're invested. Yeah, for sure. It's a memorable gimmick. And I think Disco gets a lot of hate because he, you know, he speaks his mind. He has a podcast on, on the K100. But I think people take that away from him. Like, oh, you were just a jobber. It's like, no, he wasn't really just a jobber. He was a pretty, you know, important part of that WCW no, I agree. retro era. And like, yes, he wasn't main event, but he'd always put on entertaining matches. And he always got a great response from the audience. I agree with what you said about Disco Inferno. I mm-hmm. disagree that this was an entertaining match. I, I thought it was entertaining because I'll tell you why. I thought it was the perfect psychology for a man versus woman match. They told the story of a, what would happen if a man had to wrestle a woman. You've seen so many agenda matches where they don't, they kind of just wrestle it. Like they don't tell that story. It's just like, they'll go back and forth, 50, 50, forearms, whatever it is here. Disco doesn't want to hit her. She wants to fight right. him. So they told that story great. And like, again, they said the, this match was a dud. The crowd was going, was really into it. The crowd was mm-hmm. reacting to everything they did. And ultimately when she beat him, the crowd went nuts. So I thought this match was pretty entertaining. Did it go a little long? Yes. They probably could have done it in about half this, but right. that's it. Do you want to hear the story behind why this match happened? If there is one. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So WCW wanted Disco Inferno to put over Jacqueline, right? Mm. And Disco essentially refused to do the job. Mm. I'm not sure if he asked for like other wrestlers' advice and they sort of said, oh, you can't do that. You can't put a woman over. But either way, Disco Inferno refused the job to Jacqueline. So what happened? WCW fired him and Disco was gone from WCW. Yes, he was gone for a little while. Maybe I should research that for this, but uh, either three or six months. But either way, eventually WCW comes back calling and they say, okay, Disco, you can have your job back, but on one condition that you put over Jacqueline. So he comes back and ultimately, even though he's the, somehow he's the WCW TV champion, he puts over Jacqueline and keeps his job with WCW. <laughs> That's a bit unfair. Also, if you want someone to do something, it's pretty clever of WCW. Hey, do this for me. No. Instead of going, oh, okay, he's not going to do it. You then fire them and then say, hey, you can have your job back under the condition. And it's the original condition. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's just how you force someone to do something they don't well, want to do. I, so I can see both sides to it. You know, there's been a lot of talk over, you know, especially more recent years about intergender wrestling and matches and, and I've wrestled women before and I've enjoyed it and had good matches, normally more like a mixed tag, you know, but I always found them really entertaining. And I always really enjoyed telling that story of, oh, what's going to happen when a man faces a woman. Ultimately, you could say the argument could be it's all the work. It's all the entertainment, you know, just go out there and put on a good show. I tend to go with that. 
but I can also see, you know, why he might have not wanted to do it, like to to job to a woman. Put it this way, like Hogan wasn't going to job to a woman, was he? Right. And of course. And not. and you know, Goldberg wasn't going to job to a woman. And in this day and age now, if you asked Roman Reigns to do it or Brock Lesnar to do it, they probably would say no, I assume. And that's probably what Disco thought. He probably thought if I do this, I'm going to be dead in the water and I won't be considered as a main event talent. serious contender yeah right and he's and ultimately back then and well even now you get paid based on your position on the card so of course. he probably thought if i do this i'll never get past being a jobber or mid card act and thought he was protecting himself and said no and then of course they fired him so he didn't really have much choice i think actually during this period when he was fired he was supposed to come to the wwf he was going to be the original I want to say it's right. The original rockabilly. I don't know if you remember that. No. Um, Billy Gunn after the smoking guns, they mm. gave him this gimmick called Rockab- rockabilly. And he was basically honky tonk man's protege. And I guess the original idea was so honky tonk man was billing like, Oh, I'm going to be bringing in a new protege. And the original idea was that it was going to be disco inferno. Okay. And, it, and I guess ultimately he ended up re-signing with WCW never went to the WWF. And then they had to like, W had to come up with something else and they're like, Oh, we'll use Billy Gunn. And that was obviously before Billy Gunn joined the outlaws. Um, but it would have been interesting to see how Disco Inferno's career turned out mm. if he had gone to the WWF. Yeah. An interesting what if scenario, which Absolutely. we always like. Absolutely. Speaking of Disco Inferno, if you have Disco Fever, then I have just the thing for you because our sponsor of the show Finders Keepers Records has every record you could ever imagine. Oh, yes. Finders Keepers Records is the largest used record store in the Coachella Valley with over 10,000 used LPs, 45s and 12 inch singles. So if you want to get that disco fever, disco fever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get yourself down to Finders Keepers Records. Not only does it have everything I've mentioned, but they've also got cassettes. Remember them? I loved cassettes. I I wish I still had my cassettes thinking about it. They they have (laughs) CDs. Mate, CDs. Just, it seems so weird to me that CDs are a nostalgia now, but they are. But Mm. no longer they're not because we have them at Finders Keepers Records. And not only that, but they have equipment such as turntables, speakers, receivers, It's a hidden goldmine of records, of music goodness. No longer in the La Quinta, Finders Keepers Records are now operating out of their secret location, a pop-up boutique, until they open up their new location in Old Town, Indio, which opens this November. But you want to find their secret location? You've got to book an appointment. So hit Finders Keepers Records up on the Instagram and book yourself an appointment today. Finders underscore Keepers underscore Records on the old Instagram. They're constantly getting new stock and their prices are the best in the valley. So book your appointment today for Finders Keepers Records. Get yourself some of that nostalgia goodness. You know, here on Chilling with the Villain, we're the classic wrestling review podcast but not only do we love classic wrestling we love classic music so get yourself down to finders keepers records next up is wcw united states heavyweight championship kurt henning defeats rick flair via disqualification to retain the title in 13 minutes and 57 seconds so we've got two big hitters here Kurt Henning. I never knew if it's Kurt Henning or Kurt Hennig. I'm going to say Henning. I think it's spelt Hennig and pronounced Henning, but two amazing workers here going at it. Samuel, what do you think? So, Rey Mysterio versus Eddie Guerrero. We have it. It's like one of the best matches of all time. So, and I'm like, Kurt Hennig, Henning, Hennig, and Ric Flair. I'm already like, oh, we're going to have another best match of all time. This like let me down a little bit it was a little bit disappointing it was more of like a slug fest mm-hmm. than anything 
Now, earlier you said, hey, Eddie Guerrero, is anyone better in the ring than him? And like we said, there are other, you know, like Bret Hart, someone might say, like, honestly, like Mr. Perfect, like sometimes I watch him in the ring. I'm like, like, shit, like he is perfect, right? Like, well, and he's some so people, good. people would argue Ric Flair greatest of all time. Yeah, well. and Ric Flair too. And this just didn't have the caliber to match like the the other one. It, it was a little bit disappointing. Like I said, a bit of a slugfest. Um, it just wasn't a big hit for me unfortunately because i really love both guys i'm gonna make a bold statement here i think we discussed this on the show before but yeah kurt henning mr perfect mm. he just never seemed the same in wcw as he did in the wwf he seemed just disheartened or just not interested and it got me thinking there's been a whole list of wrestlers that just didn't seem the same in wcw as they did in the wwf and the ones that come to mind, obviously Kurt Henning, but Brit the Hitman Hart, I think that's an obvious mm-hmm, one. Mm-hmm. Uh, British Bulldog, I would say Jake the Snake, Earthquake. You could argue Scott Hall. There's just a handful of wrestlers. Bobby the Brain Heenan, I think you could say. They just did not seem, they kind of lost that spark when they came to WCW. But at the same time, there's also been a handful of wrestlers that didn't seem the same when they joined the WWF from WCW and DDP comes to mind. He's yeah. on this show. Sting, Scott Steiner. You could argue Goldberg's first run in the WWE. So it goes both ways, but yeah. I always felt that way. Even Ric Flair, you could argue he seemed like a bigger star in WCW than the WWF. Well, yeah, yeah, for sure. He was there in 92. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Henning, like, Maybe more so than the others, I think. Okay. Lex Luger, the total package, defeats Scott Hall in 30 minutes and two seconds with special guest referee, the living legend, Larry Zbysko. Mm-hmm. Obviously, everyone knows who listens to the show that I'm a big fan of Scott Hall. Yes. Scott Huge. Hall is another guy you could maybe argue, in terms of in-ring, maybe he didn't have the same spark in WCW as he did in wwf you could argue that his character was maybe bigger or brighter in wcw obviously the impact he had more impact in wcw because nwo nwo changed wrestling people give lex luger a lot of crap and i honestly feel like lex luger is a pretty underrated wrestler and i say that not saying he's the best wrestler of all time but people make out he's like the worst wrestler of all time and this particular match isn't great, but Lex has had a whole bunch of matches that were awesome. I feel, and I feel like Lex doesn't get his flowers. So I just wanted to say right now, I think Lex Luger was a pretty great wrestler. He was always, especially in WCW, always over big time with the audience. Right. And ultimately that's what we base it on. Is it not? The crowd loved him. So I, I'm a fan of Lex Luger. Also, very good physique. That helps. So it does help. <laughs> so, uh, underrated, you'd say? Yes, absolutely. Gotcha. gotcha. Okay, read read out what you said, like the, the match like summary again. Read out what you said. Lex Luger defeats Scott Hall in 13 minutes and two seconds. Does Especially he, guess, though? Well, he does, but the earlier... Does Scott, he, though? Yeah, he did. Scott Hall defeated Lex Luger um, after Six Park got involved... And so Scott Hall wins with the raise's edge. And then Larry Sabisco asks to see the replay. And he says, oh, the match must continue. And then Lex Luger gets Scott Hall up in the torture rack and submits Scott Hall. So the bell already rang. To me, match closed, case closed, right? I would say there were two matches technically. He didn't say the match must continue. He said it must be restarted. So I feel like there were two matches and Scott Hall won the first one. If they didn't ring that bell, that would be fine. But to me, if you ring the bell and then you don't honor that and say match over, why ring the bell? You know, everything falls apart. We need rules and we need order in life and in wrestling. If you're looking for rules and for stuff to make sense, don't watch WCW. WCW. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You'd think I would have learned that from the um... (laughs) Thunder episode. I've just been singing Lex Luger's praises. That being said, there is one point in this match, which I was cringing at where Scott Hall has a submission on Lex Luger, where he's holding 
Lex Luger's arms behind his back and they work it for quite a while. And the whole time Lex is trying to fight out of it and spin out of it to reverse the pain onto Scott Hall and put him in the hold. And he finally turns him over. He gets Scott Hall in the same hold, but he's not holding Scott Hall's wrists. Scott Hall <laughs> is holding Lex Luger's wrists and all <laughs> Scott Hall's like selling and like, ah, uh, like he's in pain. All he has to do is let go of Lex Luger, but he's just holding himself in this submission and Lex is I, not doing anything. It's crazy. <laughs> I didn't notice that. <laughs> yeah, you should watch Dude, it that's back. hilarious. I'm the wrestler, so <laughs> I noticed these things. You know what I mean? The casual person, probably not. I don't think the audience did because they were... Um, going nuts for it but if you watch it then you'll be like oh my this is really bad and really really cringeworthy <laughs> oh man the the funniest thing about lex luger is the way he sells everything every move and once you notice it you can't sort of unnotice it every move he takes or every shot he takes it's ah oh da yo ah just constant even when he's doing moves he's making these screaming sounds it's really really funny and you, you can't sort of unhear it um but no maybe he, Matt, in a different universe he'd be a tennis player rather than yeah that's what he sounds like he sounds yeah. like a tennis player yeah but no um this match i enjoy both workers like i said massive fan of school this match eh, was what it was wasn't the greatest thing but um eh, i guess it did its job Las Vegas sudden death match. The macho man Randy Savage defeats Diamond Dallas Page in 18 minutes and seven seconds. I believe that's the longest match of the show. Yeah. These two had a long feud and DDP credits macho man a lot for kind of making his career and establishing DDP as a main eventer in WCW. Um, this was probably the second best match on the show. It's pretty enjoyable. I think so. It's the, the, it says a Las Vegas sudden death match. It's basically a last man standing match. And typically last man standing matches, I'm not a big fan of because they're so slow because of the 10 count. We've got to constantly go to the referee's 10 count and you lose that. Um, Momentum. You lo- and the false finishes you don't have or the yeah. submissions you don't have. So you kind of lose that, you know, suspense, but Macho Man, one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. They do fight out onto the um, to the Halloween Havoc set, and they do get like I think DDP or Macho Man gets thrown through one of the tombstones. I mm-hmm. thought they missed an opportunity to do a a tombstone onto a tombstone. I think would have been nice to see <laughs> missed opportunity there. I can't another wrestler that didn't seem the same in in WCW. There's a lot of them apparently. I could never get with Miss Elizabeth being a heel. Just does like who gets Miss Elizabeth, who's like national treasure, and turns yeah. a heel. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> no, that's fair enough. She looks great, by the way, during the WCW era, though. Definitely different from WWF. It's funny because I want to say Macho and Elizabeth divorced in the early nineties, maybe as early as ninety one or ninety two. I think maybe ninety two. Um, yeah, it, wasn't it like not much later after the televised, like after the wedding? wedding? Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but here they're still being put together. I'm not sure if she started dating Lex Luger yet here, but I wonder how that was to like be married for those years, get divorced, and now they're still working together. M- might have been kind of awkward, but um, Prof- no. professionals, mate. Right. But um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> professionals. But um, yeah, really good match. I love macho man randy savage he's another person i just wish i had the opportunity to wrestle or at least learn from ddp was really over in wcw he really was it kind of makes you wonder why his w run was so bad because he you forget how big a star he was in wcw diamond dallas page is one of my favorites macho man is one of my favorites when you said earlier wcw was kind of famous for having like the undercard being like legitimately good and then ending with these just I don't even know a nice word to put it like main event kind of crap fest things with huge main eventers. I was thinking, Oh, I hope you don't also include this match um, with macho man and DDP. Cause this was an absolute blast. I totally agree that the stipulation, like if, if any other match, Oh, I don't know. Just they, they did the count out thing, you know, like three times. And I'm just like, I was just thinking like two, 
would be enough to be able to sit through without it feeling without it dragging. But then that's probably two isn't enough to kind of hammer home the like the the stipulation. So they're kind of in like a no man like they can't win kind of situation, which was a bummer. Yeah. But taking like putting that aside, both guys are great. Um, Miss Elizabeth looked great and got in a cat fight with Kimberly Page. So that was amazing. I love that. <laughs> of course I did. Macho Man is my idol for a guy getting as far as he did and being as cool as he did whilst having, well, it's gone now, so I can't show it, but like a bald, big bald patch quite early on in life, <laughs> thinning hair at the tops. Didn't stop him, did it? No, it so, didn't. So yeah, no, this match, I it was very enjoyable. And I feel like on any other kind of pay-per-view that we've seen for a while, like this could have been like a match of the night. It was mm-hmm. just eclipsed by something that was just one of a kind. It seems like a shame that this wasn't the main event, really. Um, the oh, diamond dude. cutter, the diamond cutter was so over. It was definitely the most over move, I want to say. Like, I was going to say maybe the most over move in the 90s, but I guess the, the stunner kind of takes it, which is kind of funny because they're quite similar. But um, no, this match could have easily been the main event. But instead, we get a steel cage match as Roddy Piper defeats Hollywood Hogan in 13 minutes and 37 seconds. Now, I'm a big fan of Roddy Piper, one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. Of course, a Hogan fan as well. Like everyone, Hulk Hogan, you're like, well, you know, one of the greatest of all time. It's funny because I want to say it was Jim Ross on one of WWF's TV programs referred to this match. This is when WWF was taking shots at WCW referred to this match as the age in the cage, right? <laughs> and, which I feel like is a little harsh because I right. looked it up and like Hogan is only 44 here and Piper's only 43, which for whatever reason, back in the late nineties, everyone thought was really old, but now there's plenty of wrestlers that are on top of the wrestling world that are that age, or if not older, we were just talking about Jericho earlier. Yes. Um, so, but yeah, this, see, WCW just always had a habit of booking main events and just overbooking them, too much dude. smoke and mirrors. So it's a cage match, but it's not a typical like WWE style cage where it's just on the ring, around the ring. It's kind of, there's space in between the ring and the cage, like a hell in a cell, and then yep. there's no um, roof to it. But they start fighting, they're, they're, they're doing the match. There's no referee in the match. They then, leave the cage. So I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, that doesn't, how do you win this match? Whatever. Then they go back in. Then later in the match, Hogan calls in the referee to do a pin, like a pinfall yeah. to count. And I'm like, what? Like, how do you win this match? Like, are they, you know, at one point they're, they're both climbing the cage. I'm like, are they supposed to escape over? But they've already left it going through the door. Just this whole thing was a real mess. Like Piper is another guy. I would say just didn't have his spark in wcw no um ogan did but like just this overbooking and over complicating things this match had all the fake stings coming out which was just a complete utter mess um it said it was only 13 minutes and 37 seconds it felt way way longer it totally dragged and it's just so funny how this was just the theme for wcw pay-per-views that that have a really cool undercard guys like eddie and Jericho and Dean Malenko, Rey Mysterio, but then the main events would just kind of stink the joint up. Um, the one thing in this match that I must have seen before but completely forgotten, but typically when a wrestler jumps off the top of a cage, it's replayed for years and years and people remember it. This is the one jump off a cage that I feel like no one remembers or ever talks about. And it's actually pretty insane. This cage is mm-hmm. super duper high. I don't know how high it was, but it was ridiculously high. It, it seems taller than like standard cages from before. It's like Hell in a Cell height. Basically. Almost. And Macho Man Randy Savage comes out for a run in. He climbs to the top of the cage and decides to do a double axe handle from the top of the cage into the ring. And he kind of like, half hits Hogan, but he lands directly on his legs. And I was just thinking, how the hell did he not break his legs doing this maneuver? It reminded me completely of when 
Jim Cornette fell from the scaffold and landed feet first. That's what this was like. But this seemed worse because you just jumped straight off the top of the cage and no one remembers it. Like no one ever talks about it. And he, it's like the craziest thing. And it's like Macho was getting on a bit here. What was he thinking doing, jumping off the top of this cage? And to pretty much no reaction either because this match was so bad. Yeah. I messaged you when I watched that, didn't I? I was like, I feel sick. Yeah. Like, that's probably why it's not replayed because people don't want to see it. Yeah. It's like he, ch- I can't believe his kneecaps didn't just like pop off into the crowd. No, you can't land on your, you can jump off the cage. You've got to do a crossbody or people have done moonsaults, but you want to land flat. Or, I mean, I guess you could take a bump, but anything other than landing on your like feet first, anything. Oh, it made me wince. Yeah. yeah. Or like, it didn't even like, try and like do a roll or like like transfer some of the energy into a right. roll, like anything he literally just collapses and but then yeah. he's up again it was, then he's it up was again. absolutely nuts so he seems he's like insane. he was fine he's nuts and then much. and then um they cut to like a wide shot right to mm. um just get because there was a load of shenanigans by that point and yeah. that just showed you like how high of a jump that he did and landed on his feet it's mind-bogglingly high it was just, it was disgusting. Yeah. This match, man. First of all, I didn't like the look of the cage. It looked too much, not not a terrible criticism. You know, it's not the end of the world, but it looked too much like the electric fence from the first Jurassic Park, you know? <laughs> it looked kind of weird. I don't know. It didn't look imposing. It was, it was shaky, rattly, way too high. So yeah, it was, I don't know. Yeah, like you said, Hogan left the cage mm-hmm. and you think that would be it with Piper behind him. But the match didn't end. And you know, I'm a stickler for the rules. I was having conniption fits during this match. Right. Hogan climbs out of the cage, gets halfway, sees a fake sting. Because, oh yeah, like you said, towards the end of it, more stings just kept coming out with progressively more hilarious wigs. Yeah, it was really bad. There were like nine stings at once or something like that. And just the wigs looked insane. So then he, (laughs) he climbs back in. It's like... Just because there's one guy who's dressed as Sting, just well, just jump down. Like the, none of the, it made any sense. The worst thing was is that the, the crowd's dead for the whole entire match, and the only time they come up is when they start chanting, "We want Sting, we want Sting," and Sting doesn't even show up. I was like, "What?" Um, just to put things in perspective, this match was done about a month after the first Hell in a Cell match from WWE, which was Shawn Michaels. An Undertaker, which, if you remember, was an incredible match. And Sean and Taker just put on a great display. And yeah. Sean, he falls off the cage and goes through the announcer's table. And then this was, I guess, WCW's answer to that match. I don't think they even come close to touching the first head <laughs> in the cell. Like, yeah, yeah not at all. Okay. But um, it seemed well, like, a, yeah, it's a, it was a real shame to end the show this way um, and that does bring us to the end of the review so sam i think i know the answers but i'm gonna ask you favorite match on the show should i say oh. second favorite match on the show because we yeah, know, <laughs> we know yeah my second favorite match is obviously ddp and actually no we should say third favorite because that's just <laughs> we both it's clearly ray and eddie number one yeah. ddp and match man number two that's yeah. all that needs to be said i'm my number three but i i enjoyed nagata and Ultima Dragon. Yeah, yeah. That was, mm-hmm. again, a nice punchy opener. So mm-hmm. what more can, can you ask for? That would be number three, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And your, My your least, least favourite match? All right. So the Jacqueline and Disco Inferno one, like you said, had like an interesting premise. At least it made I thought sense. The execu- I thought the execution was terrible for me personally, because it was just too long and too boring. And it's just, I'm, I don't want to watch this. But Again, like at least it had an interesting premise. So I actually mm-hmm. think my least favorite match was the Alex Wright and um, Steve at Michael and Mongo. St- yeah, I, I think that it was just flat and boring. Yeah, just there's there. no pop to it at all. It was just there. Yeah. Um, I think my least favorite match probably was Hogan and Piper. Just because, yeah. it, like, to me, it's the match that most like shut the bed because it's supposed to be a main event. You know what I mean? Like, we don't expect anything from mongo and uh, alex right this is the main event you know what i mean they sold four hundred and five thousand pay-per-view buys for yeah this. and it's like for and this you give, you give them that as a main event like no that's it for me it's by far the worst match because of that i completely understand your 
line of thinking there. For me, I was like, at least it was entertainingly bad. Like you said, like the <laughs> the jumping down off of the cage and like the facings sure. and just the shenanigans. I, I was still like technically entertained, but it was it was terrible. Yeah, had its moments, had its moments. Yeah. Um, if we're talking star ratings, obviously last week we had an interview, so we didn't have a review. So we're bringing back the star ratings as a whole. Sam, what star rating would you give this show? Top to bottom. People- People might think that this is a little low, but honestly, there were, you know, there were some real high highs and then there was just very boring moments and it was pretty long. So I think overall, and this does not reflect the caliber of what actually was in the highest points of the night, but I think three out of five, I would say is fair. What it's about funny. you, man? It's funny. I, I was thinking probably the same number as well. Um, and that's still better than average as well. If 2.5 yeah. is average, so they're still saying better than average. Like I'm biased just to this whole era because of the nostalgia anyway. So it's hard for me to kind of crap on it, even if it was terrible, but it does have arguably like the greatest or one of the greatest WCW matches of all time, which obviously just brings everything up. And, you know, the first half of the show I thought was pretty entertaining, at least the first three matches or so. Lose it a little bit with Alex Wright. Um, I enjoyed the agenda match personally. Henning and Flair was a letdown. Mm. Scott Hall and Luger was a little bit of a letdown. But then the Savage and DDP match was great. Pop the main event sucked. Um, but even honestly, like the set and the theme and everything else, like that helps the overall rating. And I feel that should totally be incorporated into. Yeah the score for like for sure it we're not just going does. up by ma- like work no. or matches you know what i mean right. um so i did enjoy it a lot i would say i'm thinking between three and 3.5 maybe uh because of the main event i'm gonna give it a free three stars that was halloween havoc 1997 we always hope that you enjoy our classic reviews let us know if you enjoy our reviews, we hope so because we're the uh, classic wrestling review podcast. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you listen to this and you want more content, then of course hit us up on our social medias. We are at the villain pod on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. We're really going to start making more of an effort for exclusive content for YouTube soon. So keep your eye on that. I am the king of the shorts. I'm not, the king of being short i'm the king of the shorts or the king of the reels should i say that um our reels have been taken off on both tiktok and instagram so make sure you check that out i don't think there's anything else for me to plug others obviously other than our sponsors legacy subs and finders keepers mm-hmm. records and mm-hmm. yeah i hope everyone has an absolutely amazing and spooky scary Halloween. I love Halloween so much. So I hope everyone else listening loves it as much as I do. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good week. Till next week. I always forget that it just doesn't stop and never (laughs) stops. Let's see if I can just fade this out. Okay, bye guys. (laughs) It's done.